Today I am, let me press go on my timer. Okay, counts down from a couple of hours, you're fine. Um, today I'm going to start a brand new little mini-series. Uh, it's brand new to me, I've never preached on this before, if that may show. Um, it's a challenging one, I think. Uh, it's called uh, Living with Honour, is the series. Uh, it's something that's been stirring in me and bubbling in me and impressing on me for some time now. Uh, so I'm excited about it. It's a challenging topic, uh, and I'm convinced it's an important one too. Our core verse is Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, which say this, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Verse 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. I love that. Now that sounds to me, God breathe. That sounds to me like kingdom life. And of course we often talk in church about loving one another, the first part of verse 10. But how often do we talk about the second part, this idea of taking delight in honouring each other. So the plan uh, over the next few weeks is, is, I'll set it up this week and we'll delve into some of the challenges that this concept presents and some of the benefits of it to, to us individually and corporately over the next few weeks. But what I would say as we kick off here is, sadly I think the concept of honour is becoming rare in today's world. I think much of, of what we had has been lost. And I think the pendulum has swung far too far in the opposite direction. But when I think of this, I, I think about our governmental system, I think about Parliament, and I think about Prime Minister's question time. You know, that comprises, if we're honest, a slanging match across the floor in which it becomes about who can score points who can humiliate the other side the most viciously and who can discredit most permanently. It's ugly in my eyes and, and sadly this is the standard that's being set by the top leadership in this country. Compare that, I think, with the, with the level of respect that is held at least for the office of president in the United States. If people slagged off the president, they'd be lynched. You know, whatever you think of Mr. Obama, he will be called Mr. President with the utmost respect until the day he dies. And then you think about the wider context of culture, you look at the way that footballers swear at referees, you hear stories of school children abusing their teachers. You see the way that people talk to the police, the way they talk about the police. My question is, what's gone wrong? Is there, is there something that is missing? The flip side to this is, is when you see unexemplified. Think about some of those great movie blockbusters. When honour is exemplified, it's, scenes bring tears to your eyes. I think about... Some, some examples, I think about that amazing scene in The Lord of the Rings, the, the final movie where, where Frodo has turned his back on Sam and he's still there. He's carrying Frodo, the last little stretch of the journey, even though he's been treated badly. He treats his master. He's not really his master, he adopts him as his master and he treats him with the utmost honour. Think about Chariots of Fire bit old school. Think about the stories of, of that amazing man, Nelson Mandela, who continued to honour even the people who threw him in a miserable jail cell for 20, 30 years. And I think honour is hugely attractive. I think it's something that in our heart of hearts, deep down, we all want to see. We want to live in that climate. So the question becomes, is the concept of honour being lost. I think back to, to my school context, which is several decades ago, 
and think of some of the, the manners that I was taught d- day by day, commonplace. You know, we used to stand up when a teacher entered the room. We used to call the teacher, sir. Okay, not all of them, <laughs> but the men. We used to call the teachers, sir. You know, now, now I, I see people talking to the headmaster of the school and calling them by their Christian name. I mean, that's lovely and friendly and everything, but I call him Mr. Headmaster. That's what I call him. You know, my, one of my pet hates, I'm, I'm going to bear my soul a bit. You're going to get a couple of my pet hates this morning. One of my pet hates, and this comes from my days as a school teacher, you know, we would prepare ourselves for parents' evenings, and parents would come in to parents' evening wearing just kind of tatty, scruffy jeans with holes in it, looking a mess, thinking... Well, this is a parents' evening. This is, this is the school, your children's school. We're here to talk about academic progress and what we're doing for your children, and you, you present yourself like that. You know, the teacher's got a suit and tie on for that day. Are we missing something? And what I will say is, not quite so long ago, when I was a deputy head at Kingswood House School, I very rarely opened the door for myself. At uh, the, the school I taught at before that, um, I, I was shocked at the end of my first lesson when three or four kids came up to me at the end and said, thank you very much for the lesson, sir. I'd never had that before. <laughs> and it was commonplace. It was a beautiful habit that they'd been taught. And you know what? Some of those young 12, 13-year-old young men just inspired me. I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And I remember going to a, to a, a teacher training day uh, that, that same term as I met those kids and, and looking at the speaker thinking, you know, I'm going to honour you. I am. And I sat there in the front row with my notebook out and a smile on my face, rapt attention on this, this presenter, this speaker, all morning. And I could tell she really liked it. You know, she started directing the conversation to me. And I was just, just the way the kids used to encourage me. I thought, I'm going to encourage this lady. And then we had lunch. It was a big lunch, long lunch. And you know what happens after lunch, don't you? Trouble is, I'm now in the front row. This lady is now directing the seminar at me and my eyelids are starting to go and starting to drop under the tedium. I mean, it was probably about mathematics, so it wasn't usually exciting, maths teaching. And, and I, I, I got it in the neck. <laughs> it was a bit backfired a little bit for me, if I'm honest. Another thing that I've noticed Recently, you know, I, I go with my kids to away matches at school, away fixtures. You know, back in the day, you know, when, when the minibus or the coach of the other team arrived, there would be the teacher and the captain there, and they'd meet them, they'd shake their hands off the coach, and they'd lead them to the change rooms, and they'd wait, and they'd set them up, and they'd take them out to the ground, and they'd give them all the practice balls and everything, and they were really, really well hosted. My observation recently is we turn up, there's no one there to meet us, no one tells us where to play, no one tells us where the changing rooms are, and you're kind of abandoned to find your own way. I think that's a bit sad. You know, back in the day, and I know, I know this is going to sound off, back in the day, you know, it was always so much better then, the grass was so much greener. Back in the day, big, you know, match tea was a big deal. You know, we used to have sausage and chips. I mean, it was half the point of the game, really, was have the match tea afterwards. That social hospitality, you know, sit the teams opposite each other. They can talk about how jolly good the game was and all this kind of thing. You know, and, and I remember we used to start playing our, our hockey matches on AstroTurf, which meant we had to go away from the school to a sports centre 20 minutes ago. And I remember saying to the, the, the person who was in charge of catering at our school, don't worry, we just give them a juice box and a Kit Kat or something like that. They said, absolutely not. So they are coming to Caterham School and they're going to get our finest hospitality. So I used to have to stagger down. Not only did I have 15 kids and hockey balls, and I had to take this great big lunch box. But I think he used to drive down with it 20 minutes. Everyone got rich hospitality. Nowadays, what I've observed is you get a juice box and a Kit Kit Kat and the other team have already disappeared because they've gone back to lessons. I, I think that's sad. I had great fun recently on the tube with my father. He's 69, watching someone offering my father their seat. He was devastated. I think it was probably a stark (laughs) reminder to him. You know, there are other pet hates that I have. You know, the tone of correspondence, certain emails. You know, what, what people post sometimes on Facebook. I try not to look on Facebook, but it's on the front page of my iPad. Perhaps I should take it off, you know. Do what, does what we put on 
exemplify honor or, or dishonor, I wonder. Here's, here's another thought. You know, what, one of the things that my brother did is, my, my brother will call the Holy Spirit, Sir. I, I like that. I like that. I think I have a picture in my mind, and, and uh, thank you for humoring me. Uh, the picture in my mind is, and I actually have a book with this title called A Modern Day Knight. You know, the old-fashioned values of chivalry and respect and courtesy and integrity and sacrifice that you'd expect to see, you know, in the Knights of the Round Table and all this kind of thing. You know, and that, that, that picture to me conjures up all sorts of countercultural traits, actually, that Jesus taught and Jesus exemplified. Things like turning the other cheek, Things like calmness under provocation. Things like allowing someone who's just been horribly wronged, allowing them to have that rant without judging them. Things like esteeming other people as being hugely precious. We'll look at that in a minute. Things, things like giving value to people when no one else will. This is what Jesus did. Jesus showed love where it was undeserved and unexpected. The gospel picture, the Sermon on the Mount picture of the lofty giving a hand up to the lowly. So this is what the Bible says. Lots of, lots of verses about honour. Just to read two or three to whet your appetite today. Ephesians 6, verses 2 and 3 says, Honour your father and mother. I hear a loud amen. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honour your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. A couple of verses later. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Now that clearly was written into a different culture, into ours. It might be, it might be employees. Obey your earthly bosses with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. And then we have a, a Romans chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Everyone, say everyone. Ha 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 ha, got you now. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority, say all authority, all authority. comes from God. And those who in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Say by God. Verse 7 says, Pay your taxes. And government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honour to those who are in authority. My message today is entitled, A Culture of Honour. You know, for me, I have a dream. I have a dream where we get to live in a culture of honour. It's a beautiful dream. And in that expression, there are two words. The first word is the word culture. And the second is the word honour. I'm going to spend just a few minutes looking at each of those. If I had to define the word culture, it would be something like this. Culture is, is the value system that we operate in. It's the society that we cultivate. It's the excellence of behaviour that we propagate. I, I looked the word up in the dictionary and it described culture as this. The sum of attitudes and customs and beliefs that distinguishes one group of people from another. And it's transmitted from one generation to the next. Now one of the great privileges of leadership is, is setting, or at least helping to set, the culture. You know, we are intentional about that around here. There are certain values that we emphasise and we repeat. Have you noticed that the service hosts, myself, Martin, Mike, we say pretty much the same thing every week? Okay? That is not because we can't think of anything else to say. That is because we want our guests and our visitors to feel really welcome. We want them to be able to relax and we want them to know what's likely to happen. I mean, you notice again, pretty much every week we tell people when the kids are going to be dismissed and where they're going to go to and what age group they're in. 
This stems back to me. I was between churches. I was moving, moving cities, moving jobs. And I had a couple of weeks. And I went to one of the churches really near my home. It was a great church, really, really dynamic church. And we went. Uh, the kids were really young. We only had two at that stage. They were really young. And we, we sat in the service. No one said anything. And we're thinking, it's Sunday morning. There must be kids' church. We know there's kids' church, but no one said anything. And my kids were, were getting a bit itchy and wriggly. Okay, you know what that means? And, and, and I'm thinking, and how much longer are we going to have to sit here? And eventually we got up and we went to the back. We went out the door. We found the door that we thought was the kids' church door. And we kind of waited for another five, ten minutes until someone came out and they let them in. And this, it started. And the kids had a great time. The fact is, we had no idea what was going on. And so, you know, we're intentional about letting people know exactly what is going on and why, because we value people who want to come to us and have a look and be visitors and come and be our guests. We want to treat them a certain way. So similarly, there are, there are certain characteristics that we're trying to instill into the barn culture. If you read our vision statement, you can find it on the website, it says that the church that we see looks like this. In other words, as leaders, we've, we've wrapped our, our heads and hearts together and we said, what, what do we think church could be like? If we had our dream, if, not, if, if, everything, else got, if everything got straightened up and you know, God arrived, what would it look like? And so the church that we have looks like, and we're working towards those, those key attributes and characteristics. I'm not going to go through those today because it's, it we're taking us slightly off topic, but things like the atmosphere of worship, you know, God's presence, and we desperately value and long for and covet almost God's presence. So we're trying to move the culture in that direction. It doesn't shift overnight. You know, we want this to have a culture of life and hope. We want there to be a culture of love and acceptance. We want to have the bars of kids running around. We want to have the thrill of seeing teenagers who are love and are serving Jesus. But, but, but cultures like that don't happen overnight. They have to be developed. They have to be cultivated. They have to be worked. The example I always use is of Hillsong worship. Hillsong is known across the world for the worship that they produce and the songs they've written. So that did not happen overnight. You know, it was 10, 15, 20 years before they even produced their first CD. They had to develop and grow that culture. But I'm sure if you were to talk to the leadership there, the Darlene Checks and the Reuben Morgans and the Brian Houstons, they say it was well worth the investment to work on that culture to get us where we needed to get. Another one that we are trying to embed into our culture here is grace. You know, I long for this to be a, a, a culture of grace, a, a place where people are accepted, a place where there is, there is discernment, yes, but there is not judgment, a place where everybody's given a second chance. Wouldn't you want that for you? Yes, you would. We want that for everyone. We want there to be a culture of grace in this place, a place where you're allowed to be a flawed person on a journey with Jesus. Now, the culture I want to zero in on, that I want to focus on, is this idea of a culture of honour. It's not something we've really talked about much around here, but I, I would like people, it's what I'd love, I'd like people who walk into this church, who walk into this building, to be able to see and feel and taste and touch honour in our culture. I'd love for them to be able to see it demonstrated at every level. The young for the old. The old for the young. Husbands for wives. Children for parents. Hosts to guests. In the car park, in the coffee queue, between the music team and the sound team, between the kids and their leaders. Everywhere we want to see culture of honour being cultivated. And perhaps most importantly, we want to see it being exhibited when it's tested. When the world would fall and crash. When it's unexpected and undeserved. Our people still walk in honour, one with another. 
Let me read that opening verse again. Romans 12, verses 9 and 10. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight, take delight in honouring one another. I want people walking through the doors for the first time to taste that. And what I will say is, is a culture of grace and a culture of honour, both of them, they're not easy. That will be challenged on a frequent basis. We're going to dig into that. At times it will be complex. At times it will even be messy. And I'm going to have some fun over the next couple of weeks. Pray for me. Unpacking some of that. But I'd long for this place to be known for carrying a culture of honour. So let's talk a little bit about the second word, honour. What is honour? What does it mean? I think it would be fair to say as a, as a concept, it means different things to different people in different cultures. For most, it, it would be something like this, I think. A, a personal code that you hold yourself to. That you, so, what, what you believe to be right. It, it's a set of core values. You know, things like keeping your promises. Walking integrity, truthfulness, respect, politeness. The New Testament word for honour literally means to treat something as valuable. To treat something as precious. To treat something as weighty. And it carries with it the idea of appreciation and esteem and respect. Carried also, that is, is the idea of, of treating other people with deference and treating other people with submission. To treat something as valuable and precious and weighty. And as I, as I break that down, for me it comes down to three questions. The first one is, how would you yourself like to be treated? Secondly, do you see other people as valuable? And thirdly, of course, what example did Jesus set and teach? So let's look at the first one of those questions. How would you, yourself, like to be honoured? How, how would you like to be regarded? How would you like to be treated? How would you like to be spoken to? Perhaps almost more importantly, how would you like to be spoken about when you're not even there? Here's a verse we all know and love. Matthew 7, verse 12. It's called the golden rule. It says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. So I could, I could rewrite, you, you can rewrite that. You can insert the word love. You can insert the word serve. You can insert the word confront. You can insert anything into that one. For, for the case of our discussion here, the golden rule is to honour others as you, yourself, would like to be honoured. And if we're honest, don't we love being honoured? Don't we love being complimented? Don't we love being preferred? Don't we love being respected? And if that is the case, that sets the standard. Do unto others what you would want them to do to you. And what I will say about about our honour is honour is easy when the sun's shining. You know what I mean by that? But honour is not just how you treat someone really famous or important or someone that you really admire. It's easy to honour them. Here's the question. Can you honour the people that you really know? Can you honour those people whose secrets you know, whose warts you've seen? What about those people that irritate you? What about those people that oppose you or shame you? What about those people who treat you with dishonour? Can you honour them? Does the golden rule still apply in those circumstances? I heard this statement this week. You don't know you have honour in your relationship until you have disagreement. Thought about Jesus. Thought about Jesus with 
What was the toughest thing Jesus faced? Being betrayed by one of his own inner circle? Would, that, would, would, would it be any harder than that? When that betrayal leads to death? And yet think about that scene, the last supper scene, and the way Jesus talked about Judas. Did he name him and shame him? No. Did he give him a piece of his mind? No. Did he offer him the, the bread of friendship as part of that meal? Absolutely. He still left the ball firmly in Judas's court. He still treated with Judas with great honour, even though Judas was about to dishonour Jesus dramatically. At this point, we must say that there are certain opposites to honour. There are enemies to honour. And I thought about a few, you might have others on your list, that, that, that sharpness, that, that cynicism, that angry reaction, disrespect, bad manners. What about gossip and criticism? These are enemies of that culture of honour. If honour means to treat something as precious and valuable and weighty, then the word dishonour means not showing respect, not showing value. To treat something not as valuable but as common and ordinary. Even to go as far as treating something or somebody shamefully or humiliating them. And you know how dishonour appears. Dishonour comes out in behaviour. It comes out in tone of voice, the rolling of the eyes, the disgusted look. You know, dragging your feet to carry out a request. Maybe you've seen your kids do that comes out in complaining. And I think it's important to say that the enemy knows the power of dishonour. Because he knows the power of honour, the enemy is working very hard to infiltrate with things like gossip, with that critical spirit, with things like disrespect, with even going to its extreme, even in the form of rebellion. It's quite a bit of rebellion in our culture. The enemy, I believe, is working hard to cultivate cultures of dishonour on the sports field, on the television, in the classroom, in the home, in government. Bad attitudes, lack of respect, bad language, lack of submission and disobedience. Think for a second about some of the bad attitudes you've seen, if you watch them like we do, in some of those family-friendly movies. You know, I look at some of these and I watch them, I think I'm not really sure that I should have allowed my children to watch that because in some of these movies we see kids who are treating their parents as if they're stupid or entirely out of touch with reality. I think about the way that characters talk to one another. Think about movies in which disobedient children end up becoming the heroes. You know, and as we watch children's television in our household, we had to make some decisions. I, I preached a message once called, There's a Snake in My House. I don't know if you remember that one. And, and for me, it was some of these um, po sort of Pokemon, Bakugan, these kind of films, these kind of television programs. And I looked at the way people talk to each other. You know, people on the same side and the aggression and the bad attitude and the tone and the dishonour that was being expressed in every scene. And I thought, I'm not going to let that in my house. And we made a decision as a family to slam the door on that. Please to say my kids can recognise that. They'll slam the door on it now themselves. We're familiar with this little verse, aren't we? 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child... I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, honour and respect and submission are hard. Dishonour and criticism are much easier, but they're immature. The Bible would call them carnal. I would say that the, the honour, 
again, back to the golden rule, treating others as you love to be treated is a sign of or a fruit of maturity. But it isn't always easy. And this is where I think I'm headed because I think this is a tough issue and it will open all sorts of interesting, challenging questions, I think. How, how do I treat people when the sun isn't shining? How, how do I treat people when I'm under pressure, when I'm under stress, when I'm being intimidated, when I'm being provoked? What should I say in those situations and what shouldn't I say? Here's one, I'm just giving a little taste We'll press into this, I think, next week. When is it okay to report another person's failings as a warning? And when is that actually just gossip? Or when does it become gossip? That's a tricky one. That's one that I face quite a bit as a pastor. When is it appropriate for me to warn somebody about something? But how, how do I be, make steps to make sure I don't slip over from honour into dishonour and start talking about things perhaps I shouldn't, in ways perhaps that I shouldn't. Suppose it comes down to this. How should I treat someone when they're being a jerk? What if it's your boss? What if it's your child? What if it's your pastor? Only joking, only joking. There's a church that I've observed over the last five, ten years that, that has really set their stall on cultivating a culture of honour, and that's Bethel. Uh, and, and like me, you may have heard Danny Silk, who's written books and preaches quite widely on this idea of honour. And I, and I listen to Bill Johnson's podcast nearly every week for several years, actually. Uh, and one of the things that I loved about him that deeply attracted me to what they were doing over there one of many things, actually, was this culture of honour. The way they talked about other people, the way they valued and treated other people, other ministries. I, I don't know about you, I've, I've gone on the internet, you can Google any preacher's name you like and find any torrent of abuse you want. That's not easy. Any clown can do that on the internet and discredit and rip apart and take quotes out of context and do all that. It's much tougher to be the other way. And I remember one particular situation, some of you will be able to guess what situation this was, where there was a prominent figure who was starting to get themselves into hot water. And I remember Bill Johnson standing behind his pulpit, I listened to it on the podcast, reading out a letter that he'd written, defending and backing and honouring this person. And I listened to it and thought, well done you. I'm not sure I could have done that. I'm not sure that I could have held that measure of respect and value that he had. Because subsequent to that, quite shortly after, this other person fell quite ingloriously and it really did quite heavily backfire on Bill Johnson. But I saw something I thought was fantastic. Here's a spiritual principle that you might have heard of. What you sow you reap. And I was observing that culture at Bethel, what Bill Johnson was saying, thinking, do you know what? They're sowing seed. They're sowing good seed. They will reap a harvest of righteousness from that. He sowed honour and that honour will be rewarded and that honour will be blessed. A lot of other people in that situation sowed dishonour and they will have their reward too. I said, I saw something I wanted. I saw something that to me was very attractive. So, how do you see others? How do you see others? I was reminded this week of, of the Antiques Roadshow. I'm not a regular watcher of the Antiques Roadshow, but you know how it goes. Some artifact is presented and it's placed in front of the, the assessors and the question is asked, how much is it worth? How much is it worth? And, and the person putting it there has probably got no ideas. To them, it could be a lifeless old piece of junk. And then all of a sudden, the assessor looks at it and says, hang on a minute. And all of a sudden, this is from so-and-so, and this was back then, and actually, if you put a figure on this, this is not worthless. Actually, this is worth thousands of pounds. And of course, you watch the expression change dramatically. 
You didn't think it had value. And then you discover actually that it did. I remember listening to a series taught by Andy Stanley. And, and this statement jumped out to me. It's obvious. I mean, I'm slow. I apologize for that. But the statement goes something like this. Every single soul is a person that Jesus died for. You know, you've probably heard the line, the John 3, 16 line. If you'd been the only one, if you'd been the only lost sinner, he would have come and he would have done exactly what he did, endured exactly what he endured, just for you, because he loves you. So as you look around this room, as you look down the high street, as you look across the supermarket floor, every single soul, however young, old, good-looking, ugly, however many tattoos, however many this, however whatever it is, Every single person is a soul that Jesus loves and died for. And you know, everything changes when you start to see the world through that lens. Everything changes. I remember an example, I told you this story before, of going into the coffee shop, Tim Hortons, in Canada with someone, and behind the counter there's someone who's on their first day, it's got their name on their badge and it's got in training. This person is a nervous wreck. They're shaking. They're, 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 they're getting everything wrong. We gave our order, walked out, opened the bag, and the order was wrong. And my travelling companion said that day, do you know what, as soon as I saw them, I knew they were a loser. And something inside of me cried because I saw something completely different. I saw someone there who probably had got learning difficulties, who was probably a nervous wreck, was terrified he was going to get it wrong, was stuttering. It took all he had to stand behind this counter. Do you know what? He could have given me anything. I don't care. Because see, I felt a surge of God's love and grace towards that person. How do we see people? Do we see them as valuable? And I suppose the point is if we see them as valuable, then honour will flow from that. If we see them as worth this, then no wonder dishonour flows from that. Another beautiful picture for me, and again, I've mentioned this before in the past, is in Collingwood, Ontario, we had a, a missions lunch. Came out of a challenge from the Lord to me personally that I should know these people hanging around outside, you know, the alcoholics, the homeless, that hang outside my church. I should know them by name. So we started to run a little missions lunch for them, and we'd feed them burgers or pancakes or whatever it is. This is the sort of food they like, you understand, pizza. We'd feed them that, we'd give them a brief 10-minute, really simple gospel message. But my outstanding memory of that was we had a man in our church called Chuck Masary. And I met Chuck because he was working in a coffee bar, serving. He was a retired Pentecostal pastor trying to fill his time. And he came every single week and put the proverbial serving towel over his arm. And he waited hand and foot over these people. And do you know what? We're talking about people here who were being rejected and ridiculed every single day. And there was Chuck. That, that expression for me, the lofty, reaching a hand down to the lowly, serving them. Would you like a refill, sir? Have I put enough tea in your coffee? Are you done with your plate? And I w it was stunning. And I looked at the way he honoured those people. And you know, when, when we started doing this, we had a relatively small crowd. And, and frankly, they didn't really know how to behave in social situations, if I'm honest. And, and I think it was probably a bit of a shock to them to see Chuck serving them like this. But what I noticed over a period of weeks and over a period of months is how it started to change. Chuck continued to love. He continued to honour. He continued to serve. But the way they started talking to him started to change. They started trying to help. No, let me put my own plate away. So rather than just taking, 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 they started to give. That response changed. The numbers started to rise as people get drawn in and attracted because they were being treated with dignity and with respect. And for me, it was very, very moving. Uh, and Chuck, as a result of that, is one of my heroes. And the fact is, in that scenario, from a worldly perspective, it's upside down. It's very different. But to me... Looking through a kingdom lens, it's, it's really sweet. Okay, let's shift, move on a little. How did Jesus 
treat other people? How did he see other people? Again, we could look at example after example. What about the woman caught in adultery? In that scene, there's injustice, there's a complete lack of respect and dignity as this woman is thrown into the dust at Jesus' feet. Total dishonour. What does Jesus do? Treats her with love. Treats her as an individual. Sees through a lens of honour and grace and compassion and says, look, no one else is condemning you around here, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Stunning examples. Think about the Zacchaeus story. Familiar with that one. Zacchaeus was a hated man, hiding up a tree so he could see Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm coming to your house for tea. Everyone else going, no, I can't believe you would show honour to that man. Do you not know what he's done? Do you not know who he is? And yet Jesus honoured him in spite of the fact that everyone was looking at Jesus and judging him for it. Another wonderful story is, is in Mark chapter 14 where a woman um, comes to Jesus with a jar of really expensive perfume and starts to anoint him and starts to stroke his hair and, and, and wipe the perfume off with his, her tears. No, you, you know that story. You know, and at that point in time, the act, her act of honouring Jesus was hugely criticised. It was regarded as being inappropriate for a woman, particularly a woman of her repute, should I say, to behave like that with the rabbi. You know, they were judging her for the amount of perfume that was being wasted. Do you not realise what could be done with that? This woman was unclean, and here's she cleaning Jesus. I mean, it was up, entirely upside down through that religious lens. But her desire in that was to honour Jesus. And Jesus said, he said, her act of honour will be praised and remembered wherever the gospel is preached, if you look that one up. Jesus defended her dignity. He praised her repentance and encouraged her on her journey. That's what Jesus did. So the question for us then becomes, do, do we see that person as valuable? Do we see that person as being valuable in God's eyes? Is that person valuable in our eyes? Maybe, maybe they're vulnerable. Maybe they're hurting. Maybe they're desperately lost. Maybe they have horrible circumstances. To use the word's expression, maybe they've been dealt a desperate hand. But maybe it's your job to show them how God sees them. To show them how Jesus sees them which is rather different. My third question, what example did Jesus set and teach us quickly? 1 Peter 2.17, this verse says, respect everyone. Say everyone. Thank you. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the King. I mean, that covers just about everything, doesn't it? And, and if we look, and we will in the next few weeks, at whom should we honour the Bible tells us that we should honour our parents, we should, as husbands, we should honour our wives as physically weak vessels, we should honour our leaders. The Bible covers governmental, civil, social, spiritual. We should honour one another. We should honour guests. We should honour the poor and needy. In essence, we should honour absolutely everyone. The Bible deals with all of those issues. Our message is going to be entitled 360 degree honour. Honouring up, honouring in, honouring around and honouring down. I don't know if that's a thought as attractive to you, it is to me. And I'll leave you with this little challenge. Let's, let's create a culture of honour around here. Let's model it at every level. I'd love for us to be known as a church of honour. Because I think it's really attractive. It's really powerful. And you know, it creates an atmosphere, actually, we'd all love to live in. An atmosphere where everyone can flourish. But here's a key point. A culture of honour is created by you giving it, not demanding it. A culture of honour is created by everyone giving it to others, not everyone demanding it from others. And that applies to leaders just as much as it applies to followers. Romans 12.10, I've read it a few times. The English Standard Version puts it like this. Love one another with brotherly affection. 
And then it says, outdo one another in showing honour. Outdo one another. I love that. What a, what a challenge. Wouldn't it be great if we would do that? He said, I think it comes down to this. Now, we have been called by Jesus to live as a group of supernatural believers. Supernatural believers who serve and grow and flourish together. Supernatural believers whose task is to bring heaven to earth. You know, recreating and cultivating and spreading what I would call kingdom culture. A culture which is full of grace. A culture that's full of love. And a culture that's full of power. And our task, our task following on from Jesus is to empower as many people as we can to live like that. You know, Jesus who ministered to the prince and the pauper, to the Pharisee and the prostitute, to the meek, the lowly, the unclean, everyone actually, Jesus ministered to. Think about the book of Joel where he says, the time is coming when I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he talks about sons and daughters. He talks about old men and young men being filled with the spirit. He talks about slaves. He talks about even handmaids. You know, that would probably, in that culture, be the lowest of the low. A servant, a slave, and a woman in that culture. That person is going to be filled with God's Spirit and used for His glory. And so our call as the church is to lavishly spread the love of God. We know that. To see that love flowing through us and flowing amongst us. Taking hope and life and gospel everywhere we go. And I would say this, when people encounter us, it should be completely different. And the reason it should be completely different is because of what we carry. You know what I mean by that? It should be completely different because of who we represent. It should be completely different because when they encounter us, they encounter God's love and God's grace. When people encounter us, it should be different because of what Jesus has done inside of us. So, that's my introduction. Apologies, it took me rather longer than I'd expected. I hope you've caught the bug. I hope that this this concept, this culture is hugely attractive to you as it is to me. My my prayer is, I guess, that, that you join me in working towards creating nurturing, developing that culture. It's not always going to be easy. We'll dig into some of the challenges that this presents us with in the next couple of weeks. But as we close this morning, let's let's invite God to do in us, deep in our hearts, whatever he needs to do to make us a people of honour. Is that okay? Let's pray. If uh, Ali would like to come forward. Wherever he is, that'd be great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are well aware of the way Jesus behaved and the way Jesus treated people and the way he talked to people and the way he saw people and what he did. Ultimately, the sacrifice, the love, the grace. We know it's upside down. We know that our culture is missing out on so much of that. And we would say, Lord, we want the church to look like Jesus. To taste and smell like the kingdom that Jesus came to introduce. And as a church here, we want that kingdom culture. We want to to create an environment that is more like heaven than earth. We want to see that pendulum swinging back to a place where everyone is honoured, where everyone is loved, where everyone receives grace, where everyone is empowered by your spirit to be and do and say everything that you've called them to do. And Lord, for me, this picture, this picture of a culture of honour is hugely attractive. So my prayer very simply, Lord, is that you would do in me 
that you do in us as a people, that you do in our families, whatever is needed to be done to help us to walk and live as people of honour. So Lord, as we reflect, as we ponder, Holy Spirit, as you stir and whisper in our ears, show us, Lord, what we need to catch, what we need to do, what, if anything, we need to change, respond to as a result of this. In Jesus' name, amen.